This is Philosophy Bites with me, David Edmonds. And me, Nigel Warburton. Philosophy Bites is available at www.philosophybites.com. Philosophy Bites is made in association with the Institute of Philosophy. Academics, writers and journalists owe Michel de Montaigne a debt of gratitude. For Montaigne can claim to have invented the literary form known as the essay. Montaigne was born near Bordeaux in 1533 and died in 1592. In his essays, he addressed himself to a variety of subjects and drew on his own experiences, his reading, his travels, the people he'd met, his beliefs and feelings. The topics he discussed ranged from international affairs to his sex life to his pet dog. Many great thinkers have been influenced by Montaigne and he retains a following today. His admirers include Sarah Bakewell, author of a book about Montaigne. Sarah Bakewell, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Hello. The topic we're going to talk about is Montaigne and how to live. Could you begin by just saying a bit about who Michel de Montaigne was? Michel de Montaigne was a uh, wine grower and magistrate, mayor of Bordeaux and various other things in the course of his not very long life. He lived in the area just outside Bordeaux and he had a fairly undistinguished, ordinary kind of career as a lawyer, a magistrate in the town. And then he decided to leave that and reflect on his life. And out of that came a book called The Essays, which became an instant bestseller and still does today. It's uh, well over 400 years later. It's never really lacked for readers and enthusiasts. So what triggered that radical change of career? The impression that he gives is that he felt that he'd reached the point in life where he wanted to retire from active duty and reflect on his experience. He described himself as if he was almost at the end of his life or certainly well into a midlife crisis. In fact, he was about 37. His father had died recently, which meant that he inherited the family estate, wine-growing estate, a lot of responsibility. So he had that to look after. So it was a combination of that and this desire to retreat into himself, which was a tradition which he'd picked up really from the ancient philosophers, particularly the Stoics. Seneca used to recommend a period of reflection and philosophy once you'd completed your contribution to the world of public affairs. There he is in his study reflecting on himself and on his life. What kind of essays did he produce as a result of that? When he first started writing, he wrote a fairly conventional, a page or two on various themes, most of which he'd picked up from his favourite classical authors. So he loved to read Plutarch, Seneca, the historians, some of the poets, and they gave him the idea of just assembling interesting material on various themes, which is interesting enough, but if he'd just stopped there, I don't think we would necessarily still be reading him today. But after a while, he began becoming more adventurous and he started writing in a much more questioning way and particularly writing about himself and his own experience and the people that he'd talked to and the things that he found when he looked into himself and his own emotions and his own reasonings. One of those essays was focused on death, which was a very poignant subject for him because he had a very near-death experience. He was already quite obsessed with death in what seems a rather morbid way today. He had, of course, lost some people close to him, including his best friend, his father, and a brother. But he was almost released from some of this obsession with death after his own close brush with it. He was out riding one day, and he was thrown from his horse with somebody behind him, just crashed into him, knocked Montaigne flying. He was knocked unconscious and quite badly bruised and could easily have been killed. His friends carried him back home. He gradually began to come to, so for quite some time he was floating in a state half conscious, half completely out of it. And he uh, started to reflect on that experience afterwards because he'd tasted death with his lips, he'd brushed close to death, he had all these wonderful ways of describing it. And what he discovered was that there was really nothing to fear in that experience because he had been terrified of it, but he found it was actually just a voluptuous drifting, almost a pleasant sensation like when you're falling asleep. In fact, he was later told that while he was having this pleasant floating experience, he'd been ripping at his clothes and vomiting blood and looking as if he was in agonies. So he thought, well, death might look like that from the outside, but from the inside, nature and your own nature takes over and actually 
prepares the experience for you. It also changed his focus perhaps more towards life and more towards philosophy and reflection. Philosophy could have taken him to a, an obsession with death anyway, couldn't it? Because in the ancient tradition, philosophers learned to die. That's what they did. Well, yes, he took the idea that that's what philosophy is from the ancient philosophers. To philosophize is to learn how to die was the title of one of his essays. But in fact, I think he came to the conclusion that really philosophizing as a kind of obsessing over your own death wasn't going to get you very far. And if anything, it made dying and the process of coming to terms with death harder. And he was probably more influenced, which is an idea partly from the Epicureans, by the idea that to philosophize is to learn how to live more than to learn how to die. Also, there's an element that runs throughout his thinking that his own personal experience trumps any theorizing about anything. Yes, and his near-death experience and the philosophical thoughts that he took out of it is one of the absolutely central examples of that. He was a great believer in experience as the main source of philosophical wisdom, and one of his greatest essays is called Of Experience. It's a huge essay that rambles on about all sorts of things, as many of his essays do. But it all comes back to the idea that you learn from other people's experience through reading, but primarily you learn through your own experience. And this idea also explained why he thought that peasants who had no book learning had more wisdom than the great philosophers because they hadn't studied enough to clutter up their minds. The irony, of course, is that Montaigne may have arrived at this view, but he arrived at it after a lifetime of reading, <laughs> absolutely passionately and with deep attention, reading the classical philosophers and historians and everybody else. It probably has more to do with his idea of nature and of human nature. His reading, as, along with his own life experience, led him to the idea that we really just need to almost relax and rely on our own nature rather than trying to intellectualise or rationalise things. That's really the feeling behind it, rather than a sort of anti-intellectualism, as we might see it. But there's also a tendency to contradict himself, which is disconcerting for a philosopher. It is, and he said, I may contradict myself, but the truth I never contradict. He's saying that his self and his perceptions shift constantly, and he stays true to them. His contradictions are a part of what make the essays fascinating reading. You have a sense of a mind thinking in front of you as you read. Also, he kept on adding to the essays over a period of 20 years, and he did tend to add material rather than going back and taking things out and correcting them. So you end up with this incredibly complex surface of the text where different parts of it have been added in different stages. And sometimes one sentence will contradict the one before, but that is part of the sense of movement, constant movement that you get in his thought. Sometimes reading Montaigne, it feels like subjective experience is truth. That's all that really matters. Yeah, but it's constantly offset as well by his fascination with the world external to himself, both from just observing the physical world and other creatures, other human beings, and from his reading and sharing the experience of countless other people. There's a constant sense of the fascination with the richness and variety of the outside world. So you never get this feeling of just a mind that's lost, gazing into itself. The whole texture of the essays is rich and varied and full of anecdotes and stories. And he's as likely to come up with, with some story that's, that comes from watching his cat. There's one moment where he is watching his cat staring intently into a tree and then a bird falls out dead between the paws of his cat and and so he goes off wondering well why is this what's happening what's the process behind that so there's a constant mixture between that kind of observation and fascination with the external world and looking into himself one of his lines as it were is that you should come to philosophy almost by accident not set out to philosophize now as a philosopher i find that slightly odd I find it odd as well, although I think in a way you have to come to almost everything in life by accident. But he described himself as, if he was a philosopher at all, he was purely an accidental philosopher, was the phrase that he used. And what he actually went on to explain he meant by that was that if he happened to come out with something that was the same as something that had been said by the great philosophers of the past... It was by accident. It's because he said so much, so many remarks on so many things that a few of them were bound to coincide with the great wisdom of the ages. 
He's not a systematic thinker. He didn't devote himself to philosophy in the sense of going on a quest to discover the truth about the world or some sort of interpretation that would be his own. You do get the feeling of somebody who's just going along with life and responding to it, but trying to always look for wiser or more philosophical ways of responding to what he comes across. But yeah, you've already mentioned Stoicism, Epicureanism, and actually the other major school of ancient philosophy, Scepticism was a major influence on him as well. So it's clear that he did have this classical education behind him that was affecting the categories which he used in perceiving the world. All of those philosophies were hugely important to him. He was fascinated by them. The late Renaissance, this was a time when so much of that writing had been rediscovered. Scepticism in particular had a huge impact on his world, but he really was the prime transmitter of classical Pyrrhonian scepticism that uh, founded by Pyrrho and developed by Sextus Empiricus in the ancient world. He embodied it in so much of his thought and writing in the essays in such a way that he really transmitted it to generations of thinkers after him. It's almost impossible to imagine, I think, Descartes having gone through the process of radical doubt that he did without having had, via Montaigne, the sort of modernised version of sceptical doubt, which Montaigne had picked up from the ancient world. Descartes sort of used the idea of doubting absolutely everything as a way of laying everything to the foundation so that he could build everything up from scratch again on a more secure basis. Montaigne instead accepted that everything was in doubt, but he seemed quite happy to live with that. It gave him actually a foundation in itself for a way of living that was more prepared to perhaps consider different perspectives on a situation and not to be too sure of oneself. So it's almost as if doubt, I think, yes, became a way of life for Montaigne. For Descartes, it was just a stage to be gone through. But without Montaigne, I almost go so far as to say there could be no Descartes. It's interesting, the connection between Montaigne and other philosophers, because in a sense, he's difficult to pigeonhole as a philosopher at all. There's always been a debate about whether you can consider Montaigne a philosopher, and it's by no means certain that he considered himself one. He is a philosopher if you take quite a broad definition of philosophy that maybe is drawn more from the ancient traditions that he himself was very inspired by, according to which philosophy is a practical matter for living. It's a pragmatic set of thought experiments, approaches, ideas, ways of being that enable you to live in a better way. There's a sense in which you learn about how you might live through reading how he lived. So he's not didactic, he's not saying you ought to live as I did, but there's a kind of trigger to think in a certain sort of way as a result of engaging in his essays. In fact, you could almost compare him more to novelists than to philosophers for that very reason, which is if you read a novel like War and Peace or Pride and Prejudice, whatever, if you learn something from it that you can apply to your own life, it's because you're observing other people living their lives and you come out of it with more ideas than you had when you went in. You come out of it having shared somebody else's experience and perhaps being a little bit the wiser for it. Also, as an aside, a novel is entertaining and Montaigne is entertaining and let's not underestimate the importance of that. He's fun, he's pleasurable to read and for me, certainly, I mean, my impression of what have I learnt from Montaigne in reading him, it is very much on that level that I've seen this 16th century man coping with problems in his life or thinking about things, responding to his reading in a way that I can understand part of. I can't understand all of it because there is a big gulf between us, but I can certainly share a part of that experience through his communication of it. And that's very much what a a novel does, I think. It is also in Montaigne, I think it becomes a form of philosophy because he does it more overtly. He does it on a level that does draw on philosophical traditions. What sort of influence did he have on subsequent philosophers? Well, I mentioned he had influence on Descartes, which was not really acknowledged, but I think it was there. He had a tremendous influence on Pascal, who is another by no means professional philosopher. He found Montaigne's scepticism very hard to take, and he tried to sort of rid himself of it. In later years, he had an influence on, again, it tends to be probably the people that are a bit on the fringes of, of philosophy, Voltaire. Rousseau was very much influenced by Montaigne, I think, The whole project of writing an autobiography or writing about yourself in this absolute warts and all honest way was something that Rousseau seems to have picked up from Montaigne, but he disowned that influence. In later years, 
he was certainly an influence on Nietzsche. So again, we're talking about somebody that's off on the fringes of the accepted main core of philosophy. Nietzsche thought that Montaigne was the person that you should read in order to learn how to live. Now, you've spent about five years researching and writing this book. How did you start the project? Well, I discovered Montaigne really by accident. I mean, I sort of had heard of him a bit, but I really didn't read him until I picked him up on a long train journey where it was actually the only English-language book in the shop this was in Budapest was Montaigne's Essays. So it was a total accident, which is very suitable for an accidental philosopher. After that, I just read him incessantly. I, he was a kind of bedside companion, I guess, for many years. And I wasn't sure I could write about somebody that I admired a lot or somebody that seemed always to be one step ahead of me, because Montaigne certainly is always one step ahead of anybody who can write about him because he is so contradictory and so varied and whatever you think you can say about him. It seems like he's already said it about himself. But gradually this developed into the idea of trying to write not just about him, but about all the people who've read him over the years and have made different Montaigne's out of him. And that really became almost the main focus of my interest. Sarah Bakewell, thank you very much. Thanks very much. There's now a Philosophy Bites book published by Oxford University Press. For more information, go to www.philosophybites.com. For more information about the Institute, go to www.philosophy.sas.ac.uk. Thank you.